Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, does Clinton still have clout? She can still wow a crowd, but should Hillary Clinton get involved in the upcoming midterm elections? Everybody's talking about the nascent marijuana industry in New Jersey, but who's going to benefit once the industry is born? Learning the best tools and practices for social justice advocacy. The Department of Environmental Protection held a public hearing to discuss how re-entering Reggie will impact the state. Plus, way ahead of the November election, a 15-term Congress member gets an earful from voters. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. To a packed house of the rack, Hillary Clinton opens up about her bruising election loss, Russian meddling, partisan rifts, and the impact of women in politics. Yes, she can still hold an audience, and no, she's not going home. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. Hillary Clinton waved to the 5,100 ticketed guests at the Rutgers Athletic Center who gave her a standing ovation. The former Secretary of State and groundbreaking presidential candidate kept them transfixed for a little over an hour, talking about women, politics, and how she's not going to get off the stage and shut up. They never said that to any man who was not elected. Um, but I am uh, really committed to uh, speaking out and doing what I can to uh, have a voice in the debate about where our country's going, because maybe we'll get to it. I, you won't be surprised to hear me say that I have some concerns. Clinton appeared as the 2018 Clifford Case professorship and fielded questions from Ruth Mandel, director of Rutgers Eagleton Institute of Politics. She received a $25,000 honorarium paid not with tuition or public money, but through an endowment. She directed her message mostly at young women and minorities, urging them to run to stay politically involved. The biggest challenge we face is keeping up our momentum of sustaining the energy that I have now seen uh, across our country. And we just saw, we saw first of all in the march the day after the inauguration, and now we've seen it on the March for Life. And recognizing that that's so important and to bring people with you and to share that energy and to build those coalitions. But it will all come to naught if you don't show up and vote. To that end, Clinton's launched a PAC called Onward Together. It helps recruit political candidates, shows them how to access resources. For the faithful who flock to this event, Clinton's message, of course, resonated. We have to keep the momentum going, and if we stop, we let the bad guys take over. She's a real role model. Should she stay involved, like, with the upcoming midterm elections? I really hope that she does. Like, I really, really hope that she does, yes. Well, I don't think that she's necessarily getting involved directly. I think that she's really kind of inspiring other people to kind of go out there and, you know, change the world for themselves in their own way. But is Clinton just too controversial for the midterm campaigns as New Jersey Democrats target GOP-held congressional seats? She's already a component in red state Republicans Republican attack ads, particularly after she recently characterized Trump voters as looking backwards. People that were her biggest supporters are now saying, what is she doing? Why doesn't she just go home? She runs into some trouble, I think, um, when the Democrats are trying to be um, reaching out to Republicans, because she's, she's pretty unpopular, I think, on the Republican side. Seton Hall political science professor Matt Hale says Clinton is a champion fundraiser who could boost Democrats' chances in toss-up districts like the 11th, with its strong women candidates, Mikey Sherrill and Tamara Harris. New Jersey is, is really a centrist Democratic state. New Jersey is right in her, her wheelhouse. Now, I think there are going to be many Democrats who would like to have her uh, campaign 
campaign for them, you know, on the trail. I mean, I would certainly welcome her campaigning for me. Clinton still radiates star power. The question is whether she can stay involved in a supporting role without becoming a polarizing figure. In Piscataway, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. It's been a week since lawmakers proposed a bill that would expand medical marijuana by expanding both the number of dispensaries that issue it and the number of conditions that qualify for it. And in that time, prospective retailers have been preparing to cash in. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports on the growing canna business. Almost everywhere you turn in New Jersey's political and business communities, the talk is about marijuana legalize, decriminalize, and mostly monetize. To wit, this second in a series of symposia hosted by the New Jersey Cannabis Symposium, one of a handful of cannabis-focused trade associations that have been extending their reach across the state in anticipation of a legal marketplace. It is very exciting. Our firm created a dedicated cannabis practice law group over two years ago. And since that time, we've represented a number of clients in the cannabis space, including those who are prospective licensees in the state of New Jersey. To be clear, there is no legal marijuana law in New Jersey. There are at least two versions of a bill that haven't gotten a hearing and the decriminalization bill being touted and still other talk of a referendum on the issue. But that clearly has not stopped money people and entrepreneurs from gathering to talk about ways to make some money together. I think this industry is what I consider it almost, um, almost like wildcatting, so to speak, because it's an, I think it's an opportunity for everybody. I think if they do it the right way. The right way, a nebulous term in these earliest days of the industry. But many observers on all sides of the marijuana argument wonder if all the guys in the suits are so going to outnumber everybody else that the people who suffered the most under the state's draconian marijuana laws are going to be left out of the profits that are almost sure to follow legalization. Keith Straub is the man who, in 1970, founded the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, known best as Normal. He says New Jersey needs to make sure there's room for the little guy. I would urge people, don't limit them. Let the, let the free market work its way. Now, there will be losers. There will be some people who get a license and spend money to open a business, but over a year or two, they, they may go out of business. But that's what a free market is about. We don't want government picking the winners and losers. So I would urge New Jersey, open it up. Don't don't limit the number of licenses. None of the bills under consideration here are that liberal. And so the concern remains, how's the minority, veteran, or female-owned business supposed to get a foot in the door? When it comes to legislation, when it comes to policy, especially in New Jersey, is to make sure we have a policy that includes provisions to help these communities, to make sure that people are currently incarcerated can have these records sealed and expunged, to be, have lower barriers of entry into the industry, to make sure there's an equity program involved, to make sure people that look like us are getting involved in this, in this legally correct. When I look around this room, I see a lot more people in suits and ties than people in t-shirts and hoodies. If you look at the capital requirements for a smaller business entrepreneur like myself, it's, it's kind of difficult. I, I can't come up with $2 million in capital requirements, but I want to get involved in this industry, so I came here to partner up with like-minded individuals that maybe I can get over that hump. It's a big hump in an industry where the only ones making money right now are the lawyers, accountants, and at over $300 a person, trade associations hosting symposia on how to make money with legal weed. In Newark, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. major package of bills aimed at getting more citizens signed up to vote. The state Senate will consider automatically registering people to vote when they apply for a driver's license or permit, allow online voter registration, and expand early voting here. Meantime, the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice held a symposium aimed at helping college students organize to take political action. Michael Hill reports. Three Monmouth University students and social activists, sophomore Taffy Lashley became active last year for a mistreated friend of a different ethnicity. And if like one person said, oh, like I'm not going to do this because it doesn't directly affect me, like it'll 
it nothing will change so, like, so I feel like we need to put our like self like self interest like aside sometimes I just want to make a change uh, socially and environmentally I care a lot about the environment the youth have a lot of a voice and a say in their future and I think that's really powerful because now more than ever we need to say what we need to because of all this stuff that's going on all the shootings everything and I feel like we need to have a voice. Tamia Young, Davina Madden, and Lashley were among the eager to learn the how-tos of social advocacy at this just launched college and university social justice coalition that's tapping into a youth awakening after the Parkland, Florida school shooting. I just want to learn how to be more of a voice for people. We are thrilled to be starting this college coalition. The New Jersey Institute for Social Justice put on this session with its partners to train students and others in the do's and don'ts of advocating for social justice issues. You have to have a passion to actually want to bring about policy reform. So it's not your academic training that's going to make you successful in this space. It's your passion, your desire, your, your want to, the thing that nobody else can put in you, it has to be in you. The Institute's James Williams says, whatever your cause, do your research and learn your facts with the big goal of educating your audience. Don't allow people to move you off your spot. If you're there to talk about racial injustice, you talk about racial injustice. Because as you engage people throughout your communities, even on your campus, they'll try to move you to bring you to a place that they're a little bit more comfortable. Among the other tips, know your target audience and do power mapping. That is, find the people on the topic who can help you connect with those who can make the concrete change. The Anti-Poverty Network frequently partners with the Institute for Social Issue Advocacy and at this training session. We have had social movements in this country that have affected uh, real and lasting change. And we need the people who are directly impacted by the issues to be a part of the conversation and to really lead the way. The Social Justice Coalition says this session is about educating these young minds on how to advocate the best tools in the business, not about indoctrinating them to any specific cause. You don't have to di di dive into our three pillars. I believe having a dialogue with people, even who have completely different opinions from you is also important. And if I think something's not right or if people aren't being treated equally or anything, then I'm not going to be swayed. Some of the new faces and voices of activism. In Piscataway, Michael Hill, NJTV News. As campaigns for the 2018 election cycle kick off, political parties are gearing up for what could be contentious races. Representative Frank Pallone is running for his 16th term representing the people of Monmouth County and not taking anything for granted. Brianna Vinozzi reports on his town hall. I ended up voting against the omnibus appropriations bill or spending bill because it didn't address DACA. DACA is the program that President uh, it was a friendly crowd at Congressman Frank Pallone's constituent town hall in Long Branch, sparsely attended but with impassioned voters hoping to get the ear of a ranking Washington Democrat. How much are you willing to, do you feel you may need to compromise in order to get adequate protection for the Dreamers and how much are you willing to compromise in order to get protection for the Dreamers? I'm an advocate for comprehensive immigration reform that would let anybody who's here, not just kids, not just Dreamers, but anybody who's been here for a period of time, we usually use five years, who hasn't gotten in trouble with the law, has learned English, has paid their taxes, uh, to have a pathway to citizenship. Health care was on the mind of many in this audience, particularly the fate of the ACA, for better or worse. You call them junk plans. What is wrong with being able to choose the coverage that you want? Why can't I have catastrophic coverage? And because if you do that, right, then you are not going to be paying for the other things, and therefore the insurance pool will include, won't include you, and everybody else is going to have to pay more, including but, the government. But, but that's the whole point of insurance, that you get to pick what... No, that's the whole point. It's the I, we, While many of the congressional town halls have become infamous for raucous crowds and heated exchanges, Pallone kept the mood tempered, soothing critics. It could prove a good litmus test for the 2018 midterms. Democrats have a slim voter edge in Monmouth County, yet Christie won here twice, and President Trump took Monmouth by a nearly 10-point margin. Think liberal and conservatives have completely different ideals. 
I think the way I want to live my life is completely different from the way you want to live your life and some of the people here want to live their lives. Is there any way that we can both live our lives? I know the liberal mentality usually is government is the answer, and we don't believe that. I think that there is a middle road, and I, I try to strive for it. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, a lot of times I will articulate, as I have tonight, a liberal position, but that doesn't mean that we don't try to come together to accomplish something, right? What in particular for you are the most important issues right now? I think gun control and property taxes because I have my own home. In the wake of the March for Our Lives protests, many had concerns about action and inaction surrounding gun reform. Gun issue is a biggie. I mean, I'm a lifelong educator. Um, I've worked in schools 40 plus years and, uh, you know, the idea of teachers being armed is ludicrous. Bringing back the assault weapons ban, which we had until 1994, yeah, when I was in Congress. And then the third would be a limitation on the number of clips, the rounds of ammunition. These town halls have become an effective means for Congress members to communicate with constituents. Though one voter said to me tonight, the topic seemed boilerplate, though still an improvement over the gridlock in Washington. In Long Branch, Brianna Venozzi, NJTV News. Governor Murphy fulfilled one of his primary environmental pledges to reduce pollution from power plants by signing an executive order to have the state rejoin the multi-state regional greenhouse gas initiative. But it's a complex process, as environmental protection officials set out to explain, Leah Mishkin reports. Maybe you could give me an example of some kind of program that might be funded by this kind of grant. This packed room had questions about how New Jersey will re-enter the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, otherwise known as REGI. REGI is a group of nine states right now, and it's a cap-and-trade program, and the goal is to reduce carbon uh, from electric generating facilities. In 2011, then-Governor Christie announced the state would be leaving REGI because he said while he believed in climate change, he didn't think this program was effective. REGI does nothing more then tax electri electricity, tax our citizens, tax our businesses with no discernible or measurable impact upon our environment. But Governor Murphy signed an executive order this year to put New Jersey back into the program. For many years, uh, frankly for decades, New Jersey was a leader in smart environmental policy making on both sides of the aisle, I might add, that makes sense for today, but frankly even more sense for tomorrow. Unfortunately, over the last eight years, we lost that part of our soul. Do you think there's been an impact on the state from that time we, we left? We're probably one of the cleanest states in the country. But at the end of the day, you can't deny that those Reggie proceeds that we haven't been, uh, haven't been the ability to receive over those last so many years, they could have gone and done some very good things. The Air Quality, Energy and Sustainability Assistant Commissioner for the DEP says the benefits of re-entering Reggie are twofold, addressing pollution and helping the community. So when we rejoin Reggie, there will be an auction those auction proceeds go back to the New Jersey community. Officials told the room 60% of the money will go to the Economic Development Authority, 20% will go to the Board of Public Utilities, and the remaining 20% will go to the DEP. So it's all somehow related to greenhouse gas reduction. It could be energy efficiencies, it could be reforestation, it could be electric vehicles. It all depends. Our specific mandate is low and moderate income. So the board currently has a number of programs uh, th that uh, we do through the clean energy program that affect low and moderate income uh, constituencies. And we would uh, expect to try to leverage those to make those either bigger or better. But how much funding are we talking? You may see something as much as 30 million in a year, could be as high as 80 million, but it's really hard to estimate. Fairlawn's mayor says she's hopeful municipalities will be getting part of the money for some of their programs. And I wanted to know whether Reggie is going to work in concert with Sustainable Jersey. Are there going to be new programs that we could focus on so we could get additional funds for our programs in Fairlawn? Were you satisfied with the answer they gave? Um, I was satisfied is probably a good word. I would like to know more. It's really important that stakeholders are engaged in the process. We asked the Air Quality, Energy and Sustainability Assistant Commissioner for the DEP how long the process will take to rejoin. He says it all depends on how negotiations go. In Trenton, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. 
The State Department of Environmental Protection is reconsidering destroying some remnants of the past. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Lower Alloways Creek Township, where those tiny cabins dotting the wild marshlands may be saved after all. Starting in the late 1800s, they'd been used by those who made their living hunting, fishing, and trapping. There are just eight left, four of them on state land, accessible only by boat. Last year, when the state says it first learned of their existence, it deemed the structures illegal and in need of demolition. But with the equipment on site, the incoming DEP commissioner ordered work halted and the case reviewed. Now identical bills have been introduced in the state Senate and Assembly that would preserve them. Next to Sea Isle City, where Monday, the 80-year-old Townsend Inlet Bridge to Avalon will close to vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians for three weeks to replace part of the railing, fortifying it so cars can't take a dive over the side. When the bridge reopens, the railing replacement project will move into the third of four phases of the estimated $2.5 million project and narrow to a single lane. The good news? Tolls won't be taken until the work's done. Finally, Voorhees State Park, where the state observatory will be the best place to get your last glimpse of a blue moon until the year 2020. When full moons happen twice in one month, the second one's called blue moon because, well, they only happen once in a blue moon. But this year, we'll have had two of them, including January's that coincided with a lunar eclipse, thereby winning the title Super Blue Blood Moon. You can catch this one starting Saturday at 7.38 p.m. Your next chance to see a double blue moon will be the year 2037, weather permitting. And that's the Garden State Express for Friday, March 30th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. A community's relentless fight to save their affordable homes has drawn a rare visit from a federal housing agency. Residents of Newark's Millard E. Terrell Homes, Terrell Homes, I'm sorry, gave HUD Regional Director Lynn Patton a tour of the long-neglected federal housing complex the Newark Housing Authority wants to close because it says it doesn't have the $26 million needed for repairs. Patton gave the residents hope by vowing that under her watch, the state is, quote, no longer going to be the red-headed stepchild of the region. The two-term mayor of Belmar is resigning to devote all his energy to Atlantic City. Matt Doherty is taking over as executive director of the Casino Reinvestment Development Authority on July 1st, but decided to step down in April, telling Atlantic City's city council he'd like to work closely with Mayor Frank Gilliam's administration and find out what they want to see out of the CRDA. Despite President Trump's position there would be no federal funding for new train tunnels under the Hudson, $540 million for the Gateway Project did make it into the latest federal spending bill, though not specifically by name. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron went on the record with a panel of experts and got their take on the political dynamics of funding the project. As somebody that's a, 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 an economics person, somebody that drives economic development in a region, I want to eliminate oral politics. I would say to the administration, you're, if you're about business and growing the economy, then, then you need to really take a look at what the, the negative effects of not funding this gateway program would have on the region. There's a complete disconnect with the role that the federal government is to be playing in a national important infrastructure project. And that's really where the delay is. I mean, there are, you know, it, it, whether, whether he's using it as a political pawn or what have you, but there is a very distinct role that the federal government is supposed to play with a transportation infrastructure project, such as the importance of Gateway and how it is regionally and nationally. If there was any, as I said before, if there was any project that needed to be funded by the federal government, this is that poster child project. You thought? I find uh, the question about political intent uh, to be totally ir irrelevant. Uh, I think that uh, when people start talking about that, I want to scream, because uh, it really gets back to what uh, Janice said a couple of moments ago, which is that if these tunnels, if either one of them goes out of service, New York and New Jersey's economy will be strangled. You can watch Michael's entire interview Saturday evening at 6.30 and again Sunday morning at 10.30.
now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. There are 10 New Jersey towns that have approved a measure banning or discouraging the sale of legal marijuana. New Jersey admitted an estimated 100.9 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in 2015. Congressman Frank Pallone is currently serving his 15th consecutive term in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the 6th District. And before Donald Trump appointed her HUD regional director, Lynn Patton planned Eric Trump's wedding. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. Have a good Pesach and a happy Easter. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.